WOCA, Ocala, Gainesville, The Villages, 1370 AM, 96.3 FM, The Source. All right, five minutes after 10 o'clock. Nice looking Monday. Hope you're doing well. So uh, we do a lot of... um, different things around town to try to help out with different fundraisers, etc. And we're not the only ones. Uh, one of the guys who does fundraisers a lot is one of the editors for the newspaper, the Star Banner. Uh, and he, he, he is a butler. He's not, or he, he, I mean, he, he's the ultimate, what do you call him? Ultimate, the, uh, what, the, he's a personal butler. Yes. Um, but he's, but he's the editor at the Star Banner. Okay. Yes, he is. Uh, I, I don't know Jim Sachs with him. But anyway, so he does it, he does it really well. Oh editor. yeah. He gets into the, into the character. He does. He does it really well. And when I talk to him, like when he's just the editor, he's a different guy. When I talk to him as the butler, he's like he doesn't want to get out of character, so he'll stay there. He's James. He's James. James the he's butler, James. and he never, yeah. you know, wavers. You so, get a ride from home, James. <laughs> <laughs> so, so one day I was talking to him when he was out of character, and and uh, he was telling me that it all came from his. He was a fan of the TV show called Downton Abbey. And so that got us interested. Well, what is this show? I never even heard of it before. <laughs> and it, it's just filled with butlers. And I don't know what, never knew anything about butlers. Charles McPherson knows a little bit. He's the it's author of the book we're going to talk about. It's called The Pocket Guys. Butler's Guide to Travel. Um, Charles is a world renowned authority on butlering travel and household management he's the resident butler for the Marilyn Dennis show he was featured as a columnist in the National Post and Metro he's the founder of the Charles McPherson Associates North America's only registered school for butlers and household managers that's pretty cool oh my gosh all right <laughs> uh, we got to get a copy of this for for Jim Ross uh, hey Charles McPherson this, this is a topic is a we've never had on the show we've been doing this for 16 years so congratulations <laughs> <laughs> well it's exciting to be with all of you you have a, 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 a unique topic for us today I think it's very exciting so when you when it says you're the butler for the Marilyn Dennis show does that mean you act it's a, it's an acting job so it's actually not an acting job. It's a lifestyle show. And so for the last nine years, I go on the air and I talk about simple things like, for example, how do you set a table? How do you fold a fitted sheet? How do you get the ketchup out of your kids' T-shirts? How do you pack a suitcase? How do you send, you know, a thank you note? How do you deal with Aunt Sally who's coming to Christmas and you don't want to have to deal with her because she's not always very nice? So we talk about lots of topics that butlers are involved in that just apply to all of us in our everyday lives. So in, uh, I, I'm assuming you're familiar with the show Downton Abbey, right? I'm very familiar with it. And Mr. Carson, the head butler. Yes. Nice. Yeah, Mr. Carson, yes. yes. Okay, so so in this world of today, of 2018, this where, where there's this push cast. that men and women can do any job they want to do, how come women are never butlers? They do the same work, but they're not called butlers. Is there a reason for that? So respectfully, women actually are becoming butlers today, and there is more of a demand for them. Now, uh, there is still more of a demand for men as butlers in private households, but you'll be very proud to know that America is the leading country in the world for women becoming butlers in households. Sometimes they're called butlers, and often they're called household managers, but they're doing exactly the same job. And and when you are a butler and you're for hire does the job automatically have any boundaries or like like do you not do windows <laughs> that, that kind of thing I mean, how do you know how do you know what the boss is going to want so you know that really comes down to that's, it's such a great question it really comes down to at the very beginning when you're applying for the job is really what is the job so in some households maybe you know you work in a smaller household where you may be alone or you may be just yourself and a housekeeper where you're really much more hands on just taking care of a single person or a couple 
And then there's households where you might be taking care of multiple staff. And, you know, in some households, you could have 10, 20, 30 staff, and therefore your job becomes much more of an administrative job of taking care of the other employees who are running the household. So it's really about knowing the job description from the very beginning, which dictates what you will do and what you won't be doing. And we have learned from Downton Abbey that there are different levels of buttlering and uh, uh, valets, and that was pretty you know, in, impressive to me because when the hierarchy were going on trips, they didn't pack any of their own things. Their, their <laughs> ladies' maids or their valets would pack everything for them. Exactly. And so the ladies made obviously take care of the ladies and the valets would take care of the gentlemen. And so what's fascinating when you look at the period of Downton Abbey, which is the Edwardian period in England. So it's the very early, you know, 1904 through till the First World War, 1914, 1915. So in that Edwardian era, it was fascinating because even the staff had a hierarchy. So the most important person would be at the head of the table and the least important person would be at the end. So they had the same hierarchy as their employers did upstairs as they do downstairs. Oh, that's interesting. So now, is this a British thing that we've adapted, or it ha- did it come with, with the baggage when we decided to move over here? <laughs> so <what's, laughs> that's a great question. So what's interesting is that that's butlers actually started in France, is where the oh. first butlers really were. And the France was, in France, it was called the Bouteillet. And so the butler was the gentleman who took care of the wine, which, of course, is very important. And so from the wine, ultimately, they started to become responsible for other things, serving at the table and so on. And then the British very quickly said, oh, this is a good thing over there. And they took the butler, and that's where the butler ultimately became very famous was the British butler. And then Americans, you know, as other countries in the world, have said, oh, those butlers, you know, as we start to have houses that need to be taken care of, would be the perfect thing to make our lives easier. So it's an important thing. Uh, You talk about the best kept secrets of the hotels and of the concierge themselves. So, you know, that's the most important thing that I've learned because I've traveled a lot, you know, in my career and and so on. And so, for example, last year I did almost 130,000 air miles, which is a lot of travel. And (laughs) I never know if it's a badge of honor or a badge of stupidity. But, you know, the one thing that I've learned is that the concierge is the secret to the city that you're in. So a lot of times we think that they're just there to do restaurant reservations. But they know everything from how do you take the subway? way, you know, where can you go and buy, you know, a present that you might need for someone, or where's the local pharmacy, and what time can you go, because you need to get some aspirin or some toothpaste. They know everything about museums. So, the most important person, I think, when you get to a city and into the hotel, is to make best friends with the concierge, because they know everything that you're going to be wanting. Okay, we've picked your brain a lot about being a butler, so I want to be sure we're fair to the book. The book is advice for every traveler, from planning and packing to making the most of your trip. So does, is this if you're traveling with an employer, so you are the butler or are you on a vacation and you know your butler collar is is, is down? <laughs> yeah. So, so, so the book is really the tips and tricks that I learned not only when I was working as a butler, but also when I've traveled privately of the this best ways to travel around the world. Guess. And it doesn't mean the best ways are the most expensive, but what are the most, you know, the easiest and the most logical things for all of us who travel, because even myself as a butler, I don't get to travel with a butler. So how can we make all of our lives easier when we travel? Because traveling is stressful, no matter how you're going to travel. All right. So give us some tips. Uh, Robin and I both just got our first passports ever. Never had one. The only foreign country I've been to is Canada. (laughs) (laughs) And, And now you need a passport for that. You know, so I'm very proud of, very excited that the two of you have a passport now. Thank you. So just think of where you'll be able to go. So now, so the most important thing, and so this is why this book is going to be perfect for the two of you now that you have passports, is the most important thing, and the theme of my book, is really about being independent. You can't rely on other people to help you. And so the example is, you know, when you're traveling, for example, on an airplane, always have a little something to eat or to drink in your bag, because sometimes you have to 
delays and you may be stuck on an airplane for two hours on a tarmac where you can't go anywhere or do anything. And so being able to, you know, the flight attendants don't have anything for you to eat or drink while you're stuck there. So for me, it's about being independent. You know, when you're traveling with kids, making sure you have something to entertain the kids or, you know, something to keep the kids, you know, happy if they're hungry or thirsty or whatever. So it's all about being independent. That's a good tip. Yeah. My problem is I'd have to say, okay, don't eat this yet. Don't eat this yet. Don't eat this yet. <laughs> <laughs> I'd sit down and eat it and be done with it. So, hey, wait a but minute. You know, <laughs> but, you know, the, the, the more that you, you kind of are, are, are ready to be independent. So, you know, when you go to a foreign country, if you're going to take a taxi, kind of you've researched, okay, so I'm going to land in this airport, you know, so Google, you know, how do you get a taxi there and making sure you have local currency, making sure that the bills that you have in local currency aren't, you know, necessarily too big because an example is, you know, if you land in the United States and you only have a hundred dollar bill and you're taking a ten dollar taxi ride, you know, they may not have change for your right, for, for right. the large bill. Yeah. Or some taxis won't take a large bill. So making sure you have some small bills and you know, even though this world today really, you know, we can get go very far on debit cards and credit cards, some countries still don't have that in a taxi the way we do in America. And so again, it's about being prepared so when you get to the other end, you're not stressed. I like to uh, a pack for different occasions when I travel, and and usually I overpack, but I like to take some fancy clothes for going out to dine, and then some just knocking around clothes. I uh, I run the gamut. Is that st- is that a good idea, or am I just like overpacking? Well, I tend to be a bit of a heavy packer myself, so I hear you loud and clear. But I think what you need to ultimately do is think about what are you planning to do and, you know, putting all your clothes out, for example, on the bed before you even start to pack the suitcase. What kind of goes together? How can you mix and match? Usually trying to stay monochromatic in one color tone gives you even more options to move things around. And then think about, you know, are you really going for dinner? And if you're going to go out for dinner, you know, for example, to a restaurant with different people on two nights, you don't necessarily have to have two completely different outfits because you're with different people. And so trying to think about that will help reduce, you know, the amount that you're packing because, you know, we all now have to pay every time we, we ship a suitcase and every, every suitcase costs money. So thinking about that might help you save some money or at least not having to lug so much stuff around. And shoes are very important to me. I like my heels, but I like my flat boots, too for walking around. Yes. And so what you need to do is think about also where are you going to be walking? Because, you know, if you're going to be, you know, going out for for dinner or if you're going to be in a city where you're going to be walking around, you need to have comfortable shoes. And so that's really important. There's nothing worse than not being comfortable with your feet. Where Where are you right now? Did I ask you this already? I can't remember. Uh, No, you haven't. I'm in Toronto, Canada right now, which is where our office is in our school. And, you know, another thing I think is really fascinating is that, do you know, 50% of our students are American that come to our school. Is that right? So, so yeah. la- we're in Florida, and uh, last year, Robin, I love Florida. Robin and I went to New York City last year, and we yes. stayed, and we stayed on Long Island. So there's pl- yes. plenty of taxis in the city, but Long Island. Not so much. So we just exactly. we we uh, are new also to the Uber thing. So we 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 fa- <laughs> we found a lot. Uber is a. I love Uber. I mean, I can get it in the middle of Long Island where there's no taxis anywhere. And here comes a guy from around the corner. Who knew that he was waiting for me? <laughs> <laughs> and do you know that Uber is now the largest taxi company in the world? And so it's a really great thing to have that app on your phone to be able to call a taxi. So so this is a part of what I want to ask you when um when i'm in that city i think i know how to get around but is the the local travel like like once you get from the plane to the city then you have to get around locally is it always as easy as it is in new york where you just call a cab or an uber or something so that's a really great thing. And so that's, again, where, you know, you need to do a little bit of research ahead of time of where you're going, because the answer is no. Some cities, there's lots of taxis, and some cities, are not. like, for example, in France, if you're in Paris, you can't just call a taxi on the side of the road the way we do in New York City. You have to go to a taxi stand, and you have to wait at the taxi stand to be able to get the taxi. Oh, They're not really? allowed to just... 
stop. So it's doing that kind of research ahead of time. And so, for example, if you know you're going to a hotel and you have some questions, you can always call the concierge who is your best friend even before you get to the hotel to be able to ask those kinds of really? questions. Really? You know, in Disney World, they have rules, too. We went to Disney and we wanted to go from one Disney property to another. And so we called, yes. we called Lyft in this case, right? Mm-hmm. Yes. And uh, I can see on my little map on my phone that she wasn't where we were. And I, I thought, well, geez, that's a far walk. Where, where? Yeah. Yes. And she called me up and she said, oh, I can't come in. I, you got, you're got, you going to have to walk over here. And meanwhile, they, Disney has their own Lyft thing. So right. so I had to cancel that. Way, pay $5 because I didn't use them. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So I guess I needed so that, to, to look at that's a different world, right? Absolutely. Now, I thought you'd find interesting because you and your listeners are in Orlando. You know that Orlando has been the home for the last three butlers and household management conferences in America for the last four years. Really? Wow. Yes. That's pretty cool. I wonder what that says about us. So, <laughs> is there going on? Is, is it a good career? Is being a butler like is it? T- it's a fascinating career. You know, you go to butler school, uh, and you know it costs about ten thousand dollars by the time you've paid tuition and airfare and accommodation and so on and so forth. And you know, the average student graduates with a job within three months of between this fifty and sixty thousand dollars. Wow! And within three years, you're at seventy-five to eighty thousand. And you know, with five years, if you've continue to learn your craft, you're easily at 100 to 125,000. So it's a very, very profitable career if you're if it's something that interests you. You have to know your your employer though, right? I mean, if he likes his knife on the right side, you have to put it on the right side, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's about, so that's the art of observation and learning, and mm-hmm. absolutely, what are the preferences? And, you know, it's, it's, it's an interesting it's, job, it's but, you know, we also have to have our boundaries. Because, you know, in an office, we all know how to conduct ourselves, but, you know, our place of work is actually in your home. And we're touching your underwear because, you know, that's the kinds of things that, you know, we need to organize for you. So it's also a very different relationship because if wow. you're touching some underwear at the office, that's a problem. Yeah. <laughs> 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 do uh, uh, do uh, uh, butlers live on site? Good question. And so most of us actually do not. Most butlers are live out. So what's great about that is it allows you to actually have a personal this private life. Of Wirecast. <laughs> And yeah. when, but you're not downstairs, right? Yeah. <laughs> well, but, you know, in some households you do live in or, you know, but for example, myself, when I was a working butler, I always had my own, my own apartment, you know, away from the household. But whenever I was traveling with the family, quite often I would stay with them wherever they were. So I might be staying in the same hotel where they were and I would be traveling with them. Or if I was going to one of their other properties, I might be staying with them. So sometimes you can have a live in also. Were you expected to be a babysitter, too? So, no. Although my family that I worked for did have children, the children were, you know, uh, a little bit older. They were, you know, you know, 8, 9, 12 kind of age. So, you know, they have nannies or they have people who take care of them. But, I mean, sometimes, you know, you need to be able to be around. And so sometimes I had them in the car with me and I'd be driving them from A to B. Oh, that is absolutely fascinating stuff. Absolutely fascinating. Uh, what happens if, I, what should a person pack in their carry-on for fear that their luggage is going to be lost? And how long does it take to find it? So you need to think about where you're going. So, for example, when you go, for example, to to a southern vacation, sometimes you don't get your room right away. So having, you know, a bathing suit and a T-shirt and some sunscreen, you know, kind of thing in your bag, your carry-on is a great thing to have. I think always having a little bit of a toiletry of a toothbrush, some toothpaste, you know, a little bit of deodorant, you know, uh, is always a nice thing to be able to have with you also. And, you know, just having a change of clothes. Clothes. So I know we try not to carry too much on the plane, but I try to be able to bring stuff that if my suitcase doesn't arrive for, you know, 10, 12 hours, you know, worst case scenario, 24, I've got enough just to try to keep me comfortable with whatever else I can get locally. Nice. Can I ask some questions about, about you, your experience as a butler? Like, Absolutely. If you're standing at the end of the room while they're eating, like, are you allowed to say, oh my gosh, I got to tell you guys a joke. Are you allowed to... <laughs> 
So, first of all, it's very rare that you actually stand in the dining room and stare at them while they're eating. That's, you know, what they do in the movies because it's funny in the movies. But in real life, we tend to actually leave you alone. And so we might walk into the dining room, obviously, to serve you. And, you know, we kind of check in and out. But think of like a waiter in a restaurant who kind of, you know, comes by the table every once in a while and checks on you. That's what a butler is doing. You know, we're not standing beside, you know, behind the chair, you know, all, you know, at formal attention in in most. Really? Homes. That's very rare. So, have you ever met a butler that is like the this evil butler on Downton Abbey? We keep going back to that. <laughs> yes. I like that. Guy. To- <laughs> how come we love that? Guy? Have- <laughs> how come he was one of those guys we loved, but but he was always mean to people, right? Because we always love the mean character. We love, you know, to be able to root for the good one and to hate the evil one. And, you know, it also makes it makes for great television. But, you know, I have unfortunately seen a couple of mean butlers. They really do exist like in any profession. I'm sure you'd find this hard to believe, but I'm sure there's a couple of mean radio announcers, too. That every other radio station. <laughs> yeah. <not? laughs> They're all mean. <laughs> uh, how do you keep from getting stressed when you're a butler? So the most important thing is you have to realize, first of all, that what you're doing is a job and it's not your life. And so you have to try to disassociate what's happening in your employer's life from your life, number one. And number two, it's really important that at some point in the day, you go out, you have a walk, you go for a swim, you do something, you do some yoga. You need to try to do some kind of fitness just to let whatever tension. So just like at any job, if you were a stockbroker or a school teacher or you're a clerk you know in a grocery store you need to have a little bit of time to yourself just to let the pressures of the day go can you get too close to the family where it's unhealthy because you know you're going to be heartbroken if if you are if you go separate ways yeah, and so that's, you know, that's a danger of our job, and so we call that, you know, all about boundaries, because the problem is when you're working with them in their private home, you see them at their best, you see them at their worst, they're, you're there when they're celebrating birthdays, you know, you're there when, you know, they're, they're having losses, and so you tend to... to, to become closer to them but you have to remember you're an employee you're not a member of the family and that's hard to do sometimes wow um this is a topic i we've never had before uh the pocket butler's guide to travel it, it is about travel so and you don't have to be a butler to be able to use this advice by the way um wh- why is it called the pocket butler's guide is it a small book this it's a small book, and it's my third book. And so my first book that came out was, you know, The Butler Speaks. And so it's a larger book that has kind of lots of stuff in it about how to, you know, entertain and all that kind of stuff. And then we came out with a pocket series. And so there's The Pocket Butler's Guide to Entertaining. There's The Pocket Butler Guide to Travel, which is what we have right now. And next spring, there's going to be The Pocket Butler Housekeeping book that comes out. So there's a whole series of Pocket Butler books that we're in the process of doing uh, with my publisher, who I love, which is Penguin Rand. House, the largest publisher in the world. Uh, you have planned itineraries for the different politicians, for the billionaires of the world, and for celebrities. Uh, are you always on board with things that sometimes you think are quirky, but you do it anyway? So my rule of thumb is that when you plan the itinerary or whatever they're doing, as long as it's something legal, then, you know, it's my pleasure to organize it and to make it happen. I don't, you know, how, no matter how quirky it may be or how silly I think it might be, it's none of my business. That's not, my job is not to judge. My job is just to make it happen. And so when you talk about the itinerary, the trick for all of us is to make sure you put all of the information on the itinerary because there's nothing worse than, you know, I was in London last week with a client, for example, and we were in the car with the driver and we needed to contact the restaurant where we were going and the person who had created the itinerary didn't put the restaurant telephone number down <gasps> and so there I am in the oh, back no. you know, of the car Googling, trying to get the restaurant reservation telephone number and everything and it just makes life more difficult. So, you know, the itinerary trick is put this everything is on, the, on the sheet from the very beginning. I won't Ask, but I would love to ask <laughs> some of those yeah. stories you just didn't tell. Some of those stories, yeah, yeah. some of some of the quirky things people want you to Total arrange for them. Silence. Oh my gosh, we'll have, have to. We'll, kill you. If, if if we ever have dinner together, I'll ask you over the dinner table. Uh, <laughs> it would be my pleasure. What a fun conversation, uh, Charles McPherson. Thank you so much. It's, uh, the book 
is not here, but I'm not even going to give it away to a listener as I normally do. When it gets here, it's going to Jim Ross at the Star Banner because he is the only butler I've ever known, but he's really an editor. He's just, he plays a, a butler at, at fundraisers. Um, the Pocket Butler's Guide to Travel. Um, in addition to Amazon, do you want to give us a website, Charles? Uh, so it's charlesmcpherson.com. Really simple. And, and Amazon's a great place to get it or Barnes & Noble. Your parents nice. gave you the perfect name for a butler, by the way. Exactly. Charles is a Charles. perfect name, right? Okay, yes. Did you give yourself that name? No. Uh, so, so no, it's 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 my name. So I apologize. I've got unfortunately go because I've got my next my next radio station that's waiting. No for problem. Me. Thank you so much. It's been great, and I hope to talk to you both again. Same here. We'll be right. Bye-bye. We'll be right back. Broadcasting from the Paddock Mall Studios. This is W O C A Ocala Gainesville the Villages thirteen seventy AM ninety six three FM. Search teams are looking for bodies in areas destroyed by wildfire in Northern California. At least 29 people have died there, with another two killed in the Woolsey Fire in the south. This woman lost her home there. I found some bracelets and a thing of my dad's. And I'm kind of looking around at this jewelry right here to see if I can find a few things. It's, you know, it's kind of not usable, but um, just some memories. President Trump tweets about his trip to France with other world leaders. Never easy bringing up the fact that the U.S. must be treated fairly, which it hasn't on military.